Hello. Um, I can't see myself. I don't know why there's not like a preview. Usually there is, and it's incredibly frustrating for me. Poor me. Uh which is annoying. Oh, great. Anyway, okay, so chapter 10, Marine Reproductive Behavior. Um, your vocab, larval, reds, 11, fry, par, smolt, juvenile, uh, trochophore, veliger, petty veliger, petty means foot, spat, hermaphroditism, a hermaphrodite, protozoa, mysis, external fertilization, internal fertilization, R strategist, K strategist, broadcast bonding, viviparity, or um, viviparity, however you want to pronounce it, oviparity, um, ovoviparity, and then spawning. Ovo means egg. Um, so Darwin kind of said that the purpose of reproduction is so that we can spread our best genes for the next generation. Um, and he observed that in order to do this, organisms tend to overproduce in their lifetime, just kind of almost like a numbers game. Um, the population will tend to remain stable, and there's a struggle to survive. A, a majority of the offspring are going to die, except for the ones that are able to, um, like, combat whatever that struggle is. Organisms um, have wife variations. <laughs> they sure don't. We're going to just change that real quick. None of you guys corrected me on that. I'm, I'm taking it back. Organisms have wide variations, and um, they'll only pass on their best characteristics to their next generation. That's what Darwin said. Now, we don't see that all the time because we do have organisms that have um, pretty poor genetic defects. But for the majority, that's not the case. And those really poor genetic defects, if we're not talking on the human scale, because then there's morals and ethics, um, for the majority of that, those those are not going to be organisms that will reproduce because they're not going to have the best genes and a mate is not going to select for them. Okay. I can see myself here. I can't see myself if I make the screen big and that's incredibly frustrating for me. Okay, so I'll do it anyways. Marine larval stages. Um, larvae it, it's how they all start out, kind of like our version of um, a zygote, which is a fertilized egg, or a blastocyst when it's about um, like 80 cells big. Um, so it's the immature form of an animal, and they undergo metamorphosis, um, often having different food sources and different habitats than their adults to avoid competition. The advantages of being in larvae stage, there's less competition for food because they're going to have different niches, different roles, different habitats, um, even different larval stages. And as we've seen with the shrimp, there are different larval stages. The different larval stages will be in different areas and feeding on different things. Um, for their distribution, adults might be stuck to a substrate or sessile, if, or sessile, however you want to pronounce it, if they are um, like the clam or the, the giant clam or the oysters. Um, or even mussels, they'll be stuck, but the larvae will be able to move around and not at their own ability. They move around because they're planktonic. They just float with the water. Um, they'll always settle away from the parent and therefore competition is reduced. Disadvantage of being a larvae, lack of substrate. So just because you have high distribution does not mean that you're going to land in an area that's good. You might not land in an area that's good at all. A lot are going to get lost. A lot are going to land in a bad area. A lot are going to die. Many will be eaten. Um, they're small and they're free floating. That is another disadvantage. So they're more susceptible to predation. They're more susceptible to environmental changes like a change in pH or a change in temperature or any kind of toxins. Because they freely float, they can't change where they're at. Um, because there's also less parental care because they'll produce thousands of larvae at a time or thousands of eggs, um, many are going to die. Um, looking at our salmon, so here's the life cycle of our salmon. So we're going to start with our um, spawning adult releasing their eggs. And here you see a female with all those eggs. Females need to be big because those eggs take up a lot of space. Even though they're going to lay them, they need to have a body cavity that can support it. And it takes a lot of energy to create those eggs. There's many different salmon species. Um, both are going to spend part of their life in freshwater and part of their life in saltwater. So they're urihaline. They can, um, they're an osmo. Um, they're an osmo regulator, but they are urihaline. 
they can they obviously have adaptations that help them regulate and maintain um, a constant salinity. Uh, between the end of their life stages, the beginning and the end, in the beginning and the end, they're going to be in fresh water. They die in fresh water and they are born in fresh water. Males and females will stay their gender their entire life, so they have a fixed gender. In autumn, the sexually mature males will swim upstream to the rivers, so they need to be mature, they need to be large because going against the current is going to require a lot of ATP, a lot of energy. Um, but the males are going to go back to where they spawned, so where they were born and where their parents release sperm and egg. Um, females are going to seek really deep but free-flowing water with gravel beds. Um, it doesn't have to be extremely deep. You just want to kind of get it away from anywhere in the surface where they can be exposed to predation. And then if you have any kind of like wind or water movement on the top, you don't want it to affect what's going on at the bottom. The gravel bed is called um, a red, and that's where they are going to put their babies. And in the next slide, there's a video of them actually like making a red. That's the sperm. You can see the eggs are moving. All those little ones are eggs that she's put at the bottom and they should settle back down. But again, they're releasing so many. It's, it's normal for some to get lost. That's why they have so many. Organisms will come eat. And the small guy, the trout, he's waiting for them to leave so he can come eat them. Um, when you see their mouth, you can see their carp. The male has a carp as well. Help with predation. Um, you can continue that on your own, but depending on the species, they're going to lay between 2,500 and 7,000 eggs. The male will deposit sperm over the eggs. The mother will use her fins to bury the eggs in the gravel and for like winter and cold protection. Um, the river can't be too fast. Obviously, the gravel will be washed away and then the eggs will be exposed. It can't be too slow because then there's no oxygen coming through and the water will get kind of stagnant. Um, and there won't be enough oxygen for them to develop because even though they're in an egg, they still need to do cellular respiration inside of their tiny little mitochondria and all of those fertilized eggs so that they can start to grow. If it's too warm, the eggs will develop too fast. If it's too cold, the eggs won't develop fast enough, and that's all enzymatic reactions and metabolism, and they're born the wrong time of the year. So we're going from eggs to 11 to fries. So salmon eggs will hatch over the winter and turn into 11s. 11s is the first larval stage of salmon and they have a yolk sac on them still and they will stay in the reds. The owner of a Nissan Yellow Xterra, please report to the front desk. The owner of a Nissan Yellow Xterra, please report to the front desk. Um, as growth increases, they're going to start to use up the yolk sac and the energy in the yolk sac, the food in the yolk sac, um, and then they must go find their own food. So the yolk is used up. Now the larvae are called a fry, and they're going to leave the red. Fries are the early small, um, small larval stages of many fish, including salmon. That's where, uh, never mind, doesn't matter. But anyways, this, a lot of the small larval stages, the fish are called a fry. Um, they're going to swim to the surface so they can fill their swim bladders with air. Fish have swim bladders. That's what keeps them um, able to be buoyant. They can also release some of that air so that they can start to sink. But they have a swim bladder. Um, they, can, they can't swim upstream because they're way too small. And what else? Um, they eat many invertebrates and they grow really fast um, or even other zooplankton. We're really vulnerable many of them are going to die. Um, because they, they can't be by calmer waters upstream. They're really just at the, the expense of where they're living at. Um, fry will start to develop markings called par marks, and that's going to help them with camouflage in there. You can start seeing the par marks develop. So now from par to smolt. When par markings are complete, the salmon is now called a par. 
Um, a par is a salmon stage between a fry and a smolt. They live in rivers and have markings for camouflage. Um, they live in rivers about one to four years, and then they move to an estuary. So salmon have a pretty long life cycle for fish. Move to an estuary. Um, so going to the estuary from a freshwater, now they're also going to need to be able to develop um, active transport methods within their gills and those advantages and um, adaptations, rather, that will help them be in a different um, salinity environment. In estuaries, the par markings will start to go away. The fish will become elongated and they'll become more silver. And now they're called smolts. Okay, so we went from the egg, the 11 with the yolk sac, um, the fry, the little fry, and then the par with the par markings, and then the smolt is longer and more silver. Um, so now we're going to go to the adult. So the smolt is a um, form of salmon where you don't have any of your par marks. They're longer. They're living in estuaries. Um, they start to adapt for marine life with a silver color, and they're longer. Smolts live in shoals in the ocean, and they can remain there for one to five years. Um, they can feed in the North Atlantic and the Pacific. The fish become sexually mature when they're in the ocean. Breeding period will begin um, when the smolt becomes brightly colored. That's when we know they're sexually mature. It's awfully, often red. The male jaw will elongate to form a kite, and that's for fighting. Um, and then you're going to have a lot more white muscle develop so that you can go back to the river. Remember, the white muscle is for short, quick, heavy bursts of energy. Um, so a sexually mature adults, the difference between their muscle changes, the red muscles has a lot of myoglobin to transport oxygen, um, a lot of mitochondria because they're going to need to get energy constantly. And it's really good for aerobic respiration with oxygen and swimming long distances in the ocean. So sustaining. The white muscle has less myoglobin because it's not going to have as much blood flow going to it. It's not going to be used as often. There's going to be less mitochondria there. And this is for sudden bursts of energy, like for jumping out of the river over an obstacle. So their final days of life, the salmon can detect chemicals from their own riverbeds where they spawn, which is crazy. And they are going on that migration called a run. And they're actually a keystone species in that ecosystem. When the run is when they go from the ocean up to where their freshwater river was that they that they bred in. Um, they're a keystone species because bears, osprey, otters, um, they all wait to catch them as they're coming from the ocean, going back up river. Especially like if you get a female, that's awesome because there's so much protein in the female. Like all of the eggs she has is crazy. Like that's really good for another organism. Um, the, I was going to show a video, but I don't know if I'll have time for it. I was going to show it in class, but the salmon actually are really big influences in, I don't know what's happening in the um, ecosystem of the freshwater river because bears are going to take the carcass of the salmon and move it to the, um, so, you know, off, off the, the riverbed and eat it like in the, in the forest or something. And then even like when they poop out that whatever they didn't eat from the salmon, that is going to be in there too. I believe in chapter four, we did that and you could, there was like different nitrogen compounds that were established in an, an ocean and or was an oceanic organism and then we were finding it in like freshwater um ecosystems and um the the forest around it i believe we, got, we did an article like that and then their nutrients are really good for um the, like when it decomposes going into the soil so when they reach their gravel beds um they're going to spawn and continue their life cycle so they're going to release their sperm and egg all the pacific salmon species the majority of the atlantic males are going to die after spawning some Atlantic females, about 5 to 10%, will return to the ocean and breed one more time. Um, the advantage of having so many life stages, they have their own niche, they have their own role, they have their own habitat, they have their own food. They're not going to compete with each other and cause cannibalism. And there we go. And they are swimming up the river. The river will naturally be flowing towards the ocean. That's what a river will do, or towards a lake. It's going to be going towards the ocean. So they're coming from the ocean, going up the river. They don't want to put their babies down at the end of the river because you're going to have a lot of, you know, water flowing through. Having it at the top where it's a little bit calmer, it's going to take them a lot of energy to get there, but it's going to be best for their um, reproduction. Tunas. So cute. 
Um, so several species of tuna um, are true tuna fish. Several species of true tuna fish belong to the genus Thunus. Hold on. I don't. That sounds strange. One second. No, that's real. Um, the book says there are several species of different true tuna fish, um, all belonging to the genus Thunus. The main species are albacore, southern bluefin tuna, big eye tuna, Pacific bluefin tuna, and Atlantic bluefin tuna. All these tuna species have similar life cycles, although some differences occur with spawning grounds and ages at which sexual maturity develops. Sexes appear to be fixed, and there are no records of tuna changing sex during their lives. Okay. Um, okay. All species have similar life cycles. There we go. They maintain their gender. I just said that. Their breeding season will um, depend on the water temperature and where they're spawning at. So the Atlantic bluefin tuna will gather in the Mediterranean in May and July. Or they'll go to the Gulf of Mexico in April and June because it's, the temperatures are different there, obviously. It's different seasons. Um, the Pacific tuna meet in the J Japan Sea or the Philippine Sea. Congregating in similar areas with genetically different tunas are going to really help increase genetic variances in their species. Um, it was actually, I remember, very difficult to find a actual real document of the life cycle of a tuna. So similar to the salmon, the male and females are going to return to their original spawning grounds when mating. And again, here are their original spawning grounds at the bottom. <coughs> Excuse me. Males release sperm into the water and the females will release the egg. They are broadcast spawning because the eggs and the sperm from many individuals are in the water together. This increases genetic diversity, but there's a lot of waste, and it takes a lot of energy for the females to make so many extra eggs, just hoping that they're going to be fertilized. Many eggs are lost. Fertilized eggs have many oils in them, which will allow them to be buoyant and float. Um, this will cause them to, like, go to the surface. They're going to be preyed on a lot. They're not going to be able to be hidden. Um, Five-year-old female bluefins can release about 5 million eggs a year. 20-year-old uh, females can release 45 million um, eggs a year. Such large numbers are necessary because many will be eaten and many will die. Um, larvae to juvenile. They're so cute. Big little mouse. Um, the larvae will hatch after about two days of being fertilized, which is pretty fast. Um, they live in planktonic surface waters. So they're free floating um, with zooplankton. They are, they are a form of zooplankton. They feed on larvae of all other species, all species, not just of tuna species, but of all species. Um, they have very large heads and jaw for easy feeding. <laughs> Um, they're going to be made in their spawning grounds, and they're going to feed there until they're a little bit larger and able to move to, like, the ocean, the ocean, open ocean. Because here you see they're in the Atlantic, will spawn in the Mediterranean or the Gulf of Mexico. So they're not going out into the open ocean. The Pacific will do the Japan Sea or Philippine Sea. Um, juvenile fish shoal together to avoid predators. Um, the juvenile is a stage of life that's not sexually mature, so it would be like a preteen, if you will. Um, sexual maturity will occur between four and eight years, and that's obviously species dependent. <clears throat> Advantages of being a tuna, the males and females will meet up in a few common places. They don't have to find one mate in the vast open ocean. There's going to be a whole bunch of them congregating together. Um, the separate larval stages is going to decrease competition for food and decrease cannibalism. The spawning grounds are going to have a lot of food for the larvae. Um, the adult feeding grounds have less. The adults live in the open ocean, and they're going to spawn in seas. These seas are smaller, so they're going to they're going to have more nutrients there. Tunado. I feel like I made that word up last year, and I was really proud of myself when I made it up. They're big. Um, ram ventilation. So they swim really fast. Um, and then big tuna. Oyster life cycles. They're bivalves and they're sessile, so they, they attach to a substrate and then they stay there um, when they become adults. The larval stage will allow them to be free floating away from their parent, which is good because a parent oyster, same with a giant clam, they're filter feeders. Like they suck through water, filter out any kind of nutrients or particulates, even if it's toxins. Um, even if it's plastics, a lot of them have microplastics in them, but they will also obviously feed on their own larvae if they're there. Um, but so the, the larva will, will float away from their parent. Most species have separate male and female sexes. Um, that most can change their sex in their life at some time. They can change their sex multiple times in their life. Some live for a few years as a male and will release sperm. Um, once they're larger and have more energy to produce eggs, they can become female. 
and that's really the biggest takeaway if they're um you know switching their genders it's really based on like size and sometimes it's also based on what the environment is needing they are broadcast spawners so both the male and the females are going to release their gametes in the water it's a form of external fertilization because there's no internal anything um and and yeah there's just it's broadcast they're broadcasting their gametes everywhere whereas the salmon they're also external because it's outside of the mother's body, but it's just one male that's fertilizing. And with the shrimp, you'll see the females have the eggs on the outside of their body. One male comes and fertilizes. It's not broadcast because they're on themselves and they're choosing one mate, but it is also external because it's outside of their body. Um, much is still not understood about oyster reproduction. Yay. Um, though that a change in water temperature typically is what's going to triggle, triggle trigger the release of sperm from a few males. Um, the gametes will contain a pheromone that might stimulate the other males and females into the same oyster bed that will release their gametes too. It's common to throw one male into like an oyster bed, like like in an oyster farm where, you know, we're going out of our way to farm them um, outside of the ocean. Um, more, you know, a controlled environment. We do that with a lot of fish. So if, you know, you really only need one male that's releasing sperm to kind of set it off for everything else, kind of like a domino effect. So a spawning male will be put into an oyster bed to stimulate the rest of them. Um, 16 degrees Celsius is the ideal breeding temperature. It's about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, a little bit of warmer water is probably going to make their eggs develop too fast, too cold. It's going to be too slow. Breeding can begin in spring. The temperature is going to start to drop at the end of autumn. Um, only eat oysters in months that end in R because um, July, way too warm. Um, also, like, you know, if you're thinking about December, October, November, even October is a little bit weird. Um, September, there, you're going to have a little bit more of a, a more mature oyster. But there's also, I don't know, now that I'm, I'm like reading this, I'm thinking about like our environmental problems. I believe this was there just so they could say they're they're big enough to eat them then but um those ones are quite warm not no not november and december necessarily but october could be pretty warm september could be pretty warm especially here and i mentioned this in first period but a lot of places won't sell oysters during that time because you are really susceptible to having um strong algal blooms because the temperature is so warm and you might have really strong toxins in there those oysters are filtering out the water and all that algae and they're going to be absorbing those toxins sorry my dad's texting okay um all right so may through august breeding season um there's a lot of meat in the oyster because they're using a lot of energy to produce gametes they're they're using up a lot of their own energy stores so after their reproductive months, they're going to have a lot, a lot more biomass to them and they'll be better to eat. But again, you want to avoid, you want to avoid them eating them when it's very warm, when they're harvested and it's really warm. A lot of places won't sell them. If you do get them, um, you'll need, they'll, they'll come from the north because there's not going to be as, as much algal bloomage happening like it would be here. I'm um, sorry, many eggs get eaten and die. Females will produce 100 million eggs a year. It's a lot. Um, so from larvae to trochophores, 12 to six, six to 12 hours after fertilization, your eggs are going to hatch and now they're free swimmers. Yay. Um, a trochophore is the first larval stage um, of a mollusk. A giant clam is the same. The oyster is the same. They have little cilia on them and it allows them to move a little bit, like not enough. Um, they're still planktonic and you can see the tiny little cilia on there. Um, yeah, they feed on phytoplankton. Trochophore is the veliger. Um, so they're going to develop a shell and the organ called a vellum. Uh, the vellum is coated with cilia. And that's on the outside here. You can see the vellum has a bunch of cilia. A lot of times that's to help them like not necessarily move like a flagella tail will help them move. Maybe it helps them like inch around and helps them. Um, yeah, move past things. It's not big for locomotion. Um, yeah, so it has a veliger. The veliger has um, a vellum organ and it helps them with feeding and it helps them with movement. And then they're also developing a shell. They develop a shell and an organ called a vellum. The vellum is coated with cilia. Look at their old perculum, how cute. 
Um, the villager will begin to grow a foot, which is um, why it's called pedi. Like a um, podiatrist is a doctor who like is a foot doctor. Um, the petty villager is a third stage, and it, again, it has the foot, so that's why we're calling it petty. It's going to sink to the seabed, um, and it can also use its cilia to kind of push over it. The foot can detect where there's a suitable substrate, um, and it can uh, it's attracted to chemicals that other oysters put because you know that they grow on each other. Um, release a byssus thread secretion for sticking the oyster to the substrate. Okay, and that's probably the first time you heard that byssus thread. So let's read you what it says out of the book. Um, the foot is highly sensitive and it can detect a suitable site for settling. Um, it needs to be a hard substrate and also seems to be attracted to chemicals from other oysters. And they do, they do grow on top of each other. When an <coughs> ideal location is found, glands in the foot release various secretions that stick the petty villager to the substrate. The byssus thread, a tough material that is produced by many mollusks for attachment, is one such secretion. And now we're going to go to spats. Petty villager to spats. Um, the petty villager undergoes another metamorphosis to become an adult, um, <coughs> becoming young oysters or becoming a spat. A spat is the larval form of an oyster, um, a giant clam or another bivalve mollusk like um, a mussel. And it's going to, um, when they settle and attach to a substrate, um, the spat is what is attaching. You're going to spend three years feeding and growing into sexual maturity before they're able to be big enough and have enough biomass and energy to create um, gametes. So your spat is what's doing the attaching. So it goes trochophore, villager, petty villager has the foot, a spat, and then the sexually mature adult. In this video here, you can see them over days, real quick, starting to change. On um, the giant clam life cycle, it's the largest bivalve on Earth. Um, if you're rich, you might have like sinks made out of it, which is really pretty, like in a bathroom. Um, they're under threat and they're listed as vulnerable on the I IUNC list, IUCN list. Um, they're sessile, so they're fixed organisms. They attach themselves to a rough substrate. They're also hermaphrodites, so they're able to make male and female gametes. Um, this increases the likelihood of finding a compatible partner, and it increases opportunity to breed. It also increases genetic offspring. They do external fertilization. They do broadcast spawning. Um, and you can see them spawning here, which is really crazy. So when the clam is ready to breed, it will contract its muscles and contract a stream of sperm through its siphon. So just almost how like um, a squid moves or how a... Uh, Octopus moves, they use their siphon to like propel water out. It's like jet propulsion. Um, the exact trigger is unknown, but they think it has something to do with tides or with moon phases. To stop self-fertilization, it's bad for genetics. Then you can get um, recessive alleles with recessive alleles, and then you can actually express that phenotype. You don't want to do that. So to stop fertilization, um, the eggs are released after the sperm is released. Um, Spawning-induced substance, or SIS, hormone is released in the water, and another giant clam will release their gametes. Um, many eggs are lost, and a full-grown giant clam can release 500 million eggs at a time. Within 12 hours, they're going to become trochophore larvae, and they're going to hatch from their egg, so very similar to your oyster. Um, after 12 hours of the trochophore, it becomes a villager. It's raining. That's... Insane. Um, about a week after that, it's the petty villager. The petty villager has the foot that's really sensitive and able to settle. The villager has that, um, they're starting to develop the shell, and they have the um, little cilia to help them move around, and then they have the organ called the vellum. The vellum is for feeding and movement. Gosh, it's getting really hard. It's weird. It came out of nowhere. Okay, um, after adhering to a substrate, um, they're going to be called a spat, and this is going to take 8 to 25 days from fertilization to actually settling on the seabed. Um, spats will grow for two to three years until they're sexually mature and big enough to make the gametes. Um, they usually start as a male, and then once they get really large, become female because, like I said before, eggs take a lot more energy to produce. Shrimp life cycle, we have thousands of different kinds of shrimp. They're decapods. Um, sexually mature shrimp are living in the seafloor, the bottom of the ocean, or they're benthic, which means bottom. 
Breeding could be triggered by water temperature or by lunar phases. It's not fully understood. Um, sex determination is not fully understood in crustaceans either. Some species are males for about a couple of years, and then they can become females. Other species will stay the same. They are not broadcast spawners. They do external fertilization, but they're not broadcast spawners. They don't just freely release their gametes. Males and females will mate with each other in the deep ocean. The males will attach a pouch of sperm called a spermatocyst to the underside of the female. The female will release her eggs, and the sperm can fertilize the eggs externally. It's a better method because they're not just releasing their eggs everywhere, so there's less waste. Um, but she does have to be able to find the male to fertilize the eggs. So it does take some energy. She's not just releasing them and hoping that she has to like, literally find one. But she doesn't have to have as much egg waste. They make nine to 3,000 eggs, which is compared to you know millions, that's, that's a big difference. All right, so the Nopleus to a protozoa. So they have multiple larval stages, like way fun to have to memorize all that. So this is um, whenever they are hatching, the little Nopolis. Here's your Nopolis. Um, once the egg emerges, the Nopolis larva um, moves to the surface waters and it's going to feed on plankton. Um, they have appendages on their head for swimming and they have one eye. After feeding on plankton, they're going to metamorphosis into protozoa the second larval stage of crustaceans and shrimp, and they're also planktonic. It's good to be at the surface because you get oxygen and it's also warm. The protozoa to the mysis. Feeding on plankton continues and several molts will occur. They're going to metamorphosis a few more times until they're more larger like shrimp and now they're called mysis. The, um, uh, the alter larval form of crustaceans, alter, pausing, pausing, Yes, that didn't, like, alter doesn't make sense. Um, it's larger. They're the larger larval form. The mysis are going to be carried um, through currents to other nutrient areas of the, uh, off the coast, so like by an estuary or by a mangrove. Um, again, it's good for nutrients, good for oxygen, good for shelter. Um, they're going to land on the estuary floor, and then there they're going to be like, insects of the sea. They're going to feed on dead, rotting, decaying things and smaller organisms. Going to a sexually mature adult, they're going to, now this is like, they're going to develop into a post-larval phase. So they do have a few larval phases. The Nopolis, the Protozoa, and the Mysis. Those three are larval phases. Now they're um, after larval phases, post-larval phases. They're going to resemble adult shrimp. <clears throat> um, they're going to increase their predation and eat more. They live in shallow estuarine waters. The post larval will turn into juvenile shrimp. They're going to move into deeper estuarine waters, and then they can eat larger prey. And many times they will cannibalize as well. The juveniles can reach adult size, and then they're going to migrate out to the deep sea where they're sexually mature, and they're going to breed again. Grouper, I don't even know her. One of my favorite jokes. I'm from the office. It's the grouper life cycle. Okay. Um, there's many different species, and they have different kind of lifestyles and some commonalities. Um, most species begin as female and then later change into male, which is weird, which is weird. Um, the length of time that they spend, and this is in the book, the length of time that, the, um, that they spend as each sex varies between species and depends on the size of the fish and the number of other males and females in the area. So they have, um, quite a complex social structure that's different from other species. Um, they have hierarchy in their groups. There's more females than males in any group. If no male is present, the largest female will spontaneously change into a male. Um, a moon wrasse can do this too. Wrasse are like those um, cleaner fish. Breeding is triggered by lunar phases and seasons. And just like tuna, they're going to meet in very common areas so they can increase genetic diversity. They're not just choosing one grouper. There's thousands of groupers there. Um, They'll be in like smaller groups though. Mating can occur at night in groups of like three to 25. One to two females for multiple males. And after some fishy courtship, <laughs> females will release their eggs and the males will release their sperm. This is broadcast spawning, but they're all in one area together. So um, obviously there's a likelihood, but there's gonna be a lot of death. Um, females can release up to 1 million eggs in a breeding season. Biggest takeaway, if you're broadcast spawning, you're gonna be releasing millions of eggs a breeding season or millions of eggs a year. If you're like the salmon or the shrimp and you have your eggs on you and it's external, but you're just getting fertilized by one male, you only need to do like thousands.
Okay, um, moving on. The fertilized egg is going to float to the surface. Again, it's, um, just a second, I'm at work. Fertilized egg is going to float to the surface. Um, it's good to be at the surface because there's oxygen and it's warm. It's 24 hours um, after the larvae hatch. There's a lot of predation, there's a lot of plankton. They're flea floaters and they're going to have really long spines to deter predation. Um, <clears throat> they're going to be too big to almost eat. Um, <coughs> excuse me. They, they drift for about 80 days at the surface until they reach some coastal areas. They're just going to follow the current, taking them towards the coast. They'll find shelter in mangrove roots, seagrass beds. Again, those are really good nursery grounds. There's protection from predators, protection from waves. It's well oxygenated because of photosynthesis, and there's a lot of nutrients there. After about five years in coastal waters, um, and we have some grouper in our Indian River, the fish will go through a post-larval stage to a juvenile stage. And here's where they're going to grow a lot, especially your goliath grouper. So for the grouper so far, we've done the fertilization um the larval stage and they're there for about 80 days and this is where they're planktonic and surface waters and then when they're juveniles um or they are like post larvae so after their baby larval stage they can go to like the the mangroves and like your your um estuarine areas um when they're fully grown and they're sexually mature making sperm and egg they're going to migrate to coral reefs where they can live for 40 years the Goliath grouper, the largest grouper species, can live up to 100 years. Okay, so I do like this graphic. So it's showing in the ocean um, and near your coral reefs. Well, they're going to meet out in the ocean to spawn. They're going to float because they have a lot of oils in them, float to the surface. Um, they're going to develop at the surface, follow a current up to like off the coast. Grow, 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 grow. Um, migrate to a coral reef, time to mate again, and then here they back are here they are back again. All right, so um, I give you this. I would print it out or go through your notes and kind of fill it out yourself. Different types of fertilization: external is outside the body, internal is what you have a need for a penis for. Like that is the purpose of a penile organ. Is if something is inside of a body cavity, you need to get another organ inside that body cavity. Um, that's the purpose of like internal penetration is so that you can get that cell as close to the next cell as possible. Um, external fertilization, so gametes outside of the body. There's no guarantee the gametes will meet. Broadcast spawning is pure chance um, that one cell will meet another. It could be really wasteful if there's no mates nearby. So to compensate for that and the inefficiency of this, they have millions and so many. Chemicals in the water could synchronize their um, fertilization efforts. To help the gametes meet, a lot of organisms will congregate in the same area. Broadcast spawning is good because it helps increase genetic diversity. But um, shrimp and salmon don't do broadcast spawning. They can produce fewer eggs because they have them on their selves, um, you know, and then, and then they can release them to the water, but they're, they're right there next to them. Um, but they do need to find a mate. So that is energetically costly, and they could waste their eggs if there's no mate there. Um, there's less genetic diversity because there's only one mate there to fertilize, or you know maybe there's two or three if like a couple salmon dudes are around, but it's not too common. Um, usually the males are going to fight off another male, so the males aren't going to kind of are going to try and play around with that. But there is less genetic diversity when sperm from only one male is fertilizing um, eggs from one female. Internal fertilization, the organism is going to physically introduce the gametes inside of the other. There's a very high probability of fertilization. It's not going to get lost inside the body cavity. Um, you know, there are millions of sperm still being released. It's very common for land animals as gametes released in air would just cause them to just dry out or where they go. Um, whales and dolphins use internal fertilization. Whales will go to a breeding ground um, when female whales have ovulated. That's, that's their mating season. That's when it's mating season for human females, but it happens every single month. You'll ovulate and release an egg. Um, there's a really complex courtship between males and females and, and the females choosing the males. They are going to try and choose the wisest. In an effort to have a competitive advantage, the male whales will make really large quantities of sperm to try and flush out previous male sperm. So when the females are ovulating and they're ready to mate, it isn't uncommon to see multiple males nearby with their penises exposed 
and with large, large quantities, obviously the, the sperm, the blue whale, the blue whale makes the most amount of um, semen. And one whale might um, insert its penis into a, a female whale. And because it has such a large volume of semen, it's going to flush out the, hopefully flush out the sperm from the previous male. Survival of the fittest. Um, sharks are fish that will have internal fertilization. The males have a pelvic fin, but are claspers, and it's used to like hang on to the female, um, and it deposits sperm into the female's cavity called the cloaca, cloaca, and it ejects the sperm. Um, this is beneficial for sharks because they live solitary lives. They don't hang out in pods. They don't hang out in shoals. They don't do things together. They don't go out. They don't have a social life. Um, they're like single sex groups. They they really don't hunt together until it's mating season. Uh, most sharks will ensure a large amount of parental care. Okay, different kinds of strategists. I know you've had this before in other classes, um, but an R strategist is an organism that has a lot amount, a lot of offspring and very little parental care. Um, there's a lot of eggs because they're not gonna be caring for their organism. Um, there's no parental care. They get nourishment from a yolk sac. The mortality is, is high. Less than 1% will survive. A giant clam can produce half a billion eggs in its entire breeding season, while only one or two might actually survive. It's nuts. Case strategist. I always remember this because my name is Katie or Caitlin. And, and so I always know, like, no, I'm a case strategist. My name starts with the letter K. Um, this is the parental care that humans have. So this is going to be, you have very few offspring because it is so um, parentally and um energy costly. It's, it's a huge investment financially and emotionally and physically and mentally. Um, this is pretty much opposite of this. There's very few offspring, even in their lifetime. Um, they invest a lot of energy in nurturing them. Okay. Tuna are our strategists. There's millions of eggs with no parental care. Um, whales are case strategists and um, viparius, vivi viparius. The eggs will develop inside of the mother is what viparius means. Um, they have placenta, they have an umbilical cord, same as us. Gestation is anywhere from 10 to 16 months. Our gestation is nine full months, so almost 10. One calf um, nursing off their mother for about four to 11 months. Humans can have a baby nursing off them as long as the mother wants to. Um, should be like starting to wean, you know, all my pediatricians said around, uh, you can start like a year or 18 months. Um, Moving on, you know, some people do that till they're about five years old. Okay, calves will remain with their mother um, until sexual maturity. And depending on the type of whales, they have a really like maternal hierarchy. They hang out together a lot. They're, they're, their group stay with the mother a lot. <clears throat> um, sharks are considered case strategists because they have high parental care um, and few offspring. They don't have millions or thousands of offspring. There's three methods are used for shark species. Ovoviviparity. Um, the eggs are fertilized internally and they hatch, then they're passed out as live young. Um, they get protection and nutrients from the yolk sac and a lot of oxygen. Some shark pups can eat eggs that are not fertilized for more energy. Some sharks can eat one another in utero, intrauterine cannibalism. And uh, juvenile sand tiger sharks are born one meter long. That's my meter stick. You know, I always pull it out and show you. That's yikes. That's that's yikes. My baby was not one meter long. <laughs> 19 inches. Um, oviparity, the leg, they lay eggs, usually called a mermaid's purse. Um, this is what a shark can do. So they're, they're releasing their eggs. They're not allowing it to hatch inside of them. Um, it's attached to rocks or seaweeds. It's guarded by the mother. And they're going to live off a nutrient supply in the yolk sac. Even our own offspring are going to live off a nutrient supply in a yolk sac. But eventually that yolk sac goes away. Um, viviparity are like hammerheads and bull sharks. They give birth to live sharks that have lived off a of placenta and are born ready to rock and roll. It's so funny. I said that. I love myself. Um, there you go. There we go. Boom. Done. Well done, Parrot. <laughs> oh, I wish I was my own teacher. I am my own teacher. What am I saying? All right, guys. Well, Next week, we got chapter 11, and then you only have five more weeks, and you're done with this class. How exciting. Godspeed to you all. This is my shortest lecture.
All right. See you tomorrow.